the definition of a nerve entrapment now and why I feel that the word entrapment is improper nomenclature in describing what's actually occurring with neural symptoms. When you say that a nerve has become entrapped, most people have this understanding or this visualization that the nerve is somehow being held in a position by the structure and trapping it. So when you say you have median nerve trapped at the pronator teres, you have the idea that the pronator teres is holding onto that nerve and not allowing it to slide at all. Or it's stapled to the muscle or stapled to the thing that's entrapping it. If this was the case, when you were to forcefully put your, your head one way and your arm the other way, you would have an exonotomesis. You would sever that nerve and you would cause severe damage. If you look at the research as to how much nerves are supposed to move with head movement and arm movement, you see that there is a lot of glide that occurs in a nerve. If you believe that something's entrapping that nerve so that there's zero glide, a person with a nerve entrapment should not be able to laterally flex their head because the nerve would tug and it would cause searing lightning bolt pain down their arm, which doesn't occur. Now we've all been talking about fascial restrictions and fascial adhesions and how the fascia is dynamic structure that can move and change frequently. What is happening with the nerve entrapment, or what I like to call a frictional irritation, should be described as an area of increased friction due to either fascial contractility, possibly due to muscle spasm, that is causing an irritation of the outer layer of the nerve. So everyone remembers that all nerves are entrapped in a neural sheath. And we talked about the, um, what's it called? The myelin sheath. The myelin sheath, thank you. The myelin sheath would be akin to, if you take a wire and there's the rubber around the wire. If you were to strip the wire, the copper is now, is now uh, accessible to touch. If you were to touch the copper, you would get discharges or irritation of a nerve in this case. The same thing's going to happen in a high friction area. If the, fri if the friction in an area is enough, it will start to peel off or kill that myelin sheath. Okay? If that myelin sheath is gone, now you have axon fibers that are exposed, and hence you'll start to get numbing and tingling. But it's not like the nerve has been stapled to one spot. The nerve can still move. It's just moving through a high friction area. So the proper, the proper nomenclature would therefore be frictional irritation. Now why does this make a difference? It makes a difference because, because people believe that it's a trap, there's also another belief out there that you can release the nerve and the symptoms will go away. Now I've been treating people for quite a long time. I've treated quite a few nerve entrapments. Never has one treatment ever fixed a nerve. Why? Because if there's enough frictional irritation to take away the myelin sheath, magically releasing the nerve is not going to all of a sudden cause the myelin sheath to regenerate. That's going to, be, that's going to take time. So what I advise people when you're treating neural irritations is to treat the area to remove the friction that's occurring that's irritating that nerve and then allow sufficient time for that myelin sheath to regenerate. This might mean treating the nerve entrapment or frictional irritation several times until you feel that all of the tension has been removed and then tell a person to come back after a certain amount of time in order that that myelin sheath can regenerate. Similarly, if you have somebody coming in with a nerve frictional irritation and you decide to give them uh, flossing exercises, flossing exercises are fine once the source of the frictional irritation is removed. But if they come in on the first visit, Unless you're the best myofascial person in the world, you're probably not going to get rid of all that friction in one visit. So then if you tell them after the first visit to go ahead and start doing neural flossing, what exactly are you doing? You're irritating the nerve further. So in my opinion, you would want to wait until you're confident that all of that tension has been removed before you start giving exercises such as neural flossing techniques. Similarly, remember, when you're treating, you are going to cause irritation to that nerve. You're pushing on the structure. You're going to try to stay away from the nerve as much as possible. You're going to try to promote neural gliding by holding the nerves or holding the muscles in place and then allowing the nerves to move or slide better. But it doesn't matter how much you try, you are going to cause compression on your nerve, especially if you're dealing with small nerves in the arm. The sciatic nerve, I understand. If you're palpating, you stay on one side, stay on the other, that's fine. If you're dealing with the median nerve, your thumb is, is a lot bigger 
uh, than all of the muscles and the nerves that you're going to be trying to release. So you have to understand that you might cause irritation, and the patient has to understand that more importantly. Okay, do you have any questions about that neural frictional irritation? Of course, there's other things that are occurring in frictional irritation. There's uh, lymphatic backup. There's the, the friction or the, the contractility of the fascia will decrease um, venous blood back to the heart. So you can get venous pooling. And compression via the blood might also contribute to the irritation of the nerve. So I'm not saying that the fascia is the only reason. The fascial contractility can cause all of these other things to occur. Thank you.